بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Good evening everybody and thank you so much for joining us uh, in this HLH uh, webinar titled HLH as a Threshold Disease which is one of many webinars conducted successfully by SSPD during this pandemic. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Saudi Society for Blood Disorder for this great organization. Also, I would like to thank Subi for sponsoring this uh, great event. Uh, tonight, we are honored to have three distinguished speakers to cover three important uh, topics of HLH spectrum. Our speakers are well known to all of us, so I will not go over their CVs. And uh, it, uh, it's a great honor to have Dr. Carl Allen among us tonight. Dr. Allen is the co-director of Texas Children's Cancer Center, Histocytosis and Lymphoma Program. And he is also director of research, Global Hematology Oncology Pediatric Excellence and an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Section of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology uh, at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Allen is going to present us tonight HLH management in 2020. Also, uh, it's a, a great honor to introduce Dr. Hind Salama, who is a consultant adult uh, hematologist and stem cell transplanter at King Abdelaziz Medical City in Riyadh. Dr. Salama is going to tell us about another phase of HLH in adults. She will be talking about secondary HLH in adults. And uh, finally, we, uh, it, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Abdullah Asumbul, who is a consultant pediatric rheumatologist at King Faisal Specialist Hospital uh, in Riyadh. Dr. Asumbul will be presenting rheumatological phase of HLH. So he'll be talking about macrophage activation syndrome. And uh, before uh, letting you enjoy the talks, I would like to have a few announcements. Please use the uh, Q&A section at the bottom of your section, uh, screen to send us your questions so we can answer it at the end of the webinar. So please stay with us uh, till the end. And be reminded that uh, this webinar will be recorded and will be uh, available at SSBD YouTube channels. Uh, without further ado, I kindly ask Dr. Allen to give us his talk over the coming 30 minutes. Dr. Allen, please, the podium is yours. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, truly an honor to be invited uh, to, to join the Saudi Society for Blood Disorders. And um, it's a pleasure to, to share this evening with you. Um, I, I'm, as I mentioned, uh, sort of as we were getting started, I, I look forward to an opportunity to meet all of you in person, but um, I also appreciate the ability for us to have an enhanced communication with Zoom. So I will, um, tr I need to be able to share my screen um, to be able to look at the talk up. I'm not seeing that capability. Let's see. I might need um, some technical assistance to um, so yeah, you can click the arrow, the green arrow. Here we go, share screen. Yeah. It showed up. Okay, is that the correct view? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to talk today about um, HLH, which I think um, is it's a really poignant topic um, for a lot of reasons. I think that um, the disease itself right now is sort of going undergoing a, a, a uh, several paradigm changes as far as the, the treatment for um, newly diagnosed patients for diagnosis. Um, and also I think it's helping us to conceptualize um, other complex inflammatory diseases. Um, and I'll talk, um, sorry. I'll talk a bit about, um, you know, first of all, what is HLH and then discuss a little bit of the, the prevalence as far as our understanding, and then look at the clinical presentations and pathophysiology. And I think um, most people agree on what familial HLH is, but some once we get into secondary HLH and shades of red, I think that becomes more complicated. And then, of course, I'll talk about some of the recent interest in, in lessons from HLH as it perhaps applies to, to management of patients with COVID infection. So first of all, when we say what is HLH, I'm not sure if this um, metaphor uh, um, uh, 
is applicable, but in the U.S., sometimes when we're training in general pediatrics, we're we're told you know everyone wants to find a zebra, but really when you hear hoofbeats, it's probably a horse. Meaning, um, even though we're we're primed to look for very very rare things, common things are generally common. And so, in the case of HLH, there's quite a lot of discussion really about what is this disease. And um, sometimes when we go into the to the, the intensive care unit and discuss complicated patients with our with our intensivist colleagues that you know we'll say well look this is just sepsis this is um, just an infection and we're trying to make everything HLH so is what truly is HLH versus what's um, what's a mimic and then um, I don't know again if, if you have the same experience in your institutions but sometimes I'll be asked do you believe in HLH and it's the only uh, kind of faith-based diagnosis I'm I'm aware of um, so when people are looking for diseases I think one of the problems is that we all think about different things when we think about um, what HLH is. And this is a critically important question of identifying what exactly HLH is because of the, the dire consequences of missing a diagnosis. So approximately 50, probably a little bit better than that now, 50 to 75% of patients who meet criteria for HLH and are treated appropriately have a chance at survival, where if we don't diagnose HLH, fewer than 10% of those patients are going to survive. Um, and also the majority of deaths occur in the first eight weeks, so we don't have a lot of time to, um, to delay diagnosis. And so how prevalent is HLH? Well, that really depends on a lot of things. I mean, it depends on ethnicity, exposures. Um, I think uh, different um, uh, associated mutations are more common in different populations, but also you have to look for it. So in the United States, for example, we have quite a lot of variability, even among the large children's hospitals whether or not HLH is diagnosed frequently, infrequently or not at all. And then ICD-9 and 10 coding refers to how we um, kind of do billing for, um, for diseases. And there's quite a lot of studies that mine this data, but uh, there's about 20 different uh, codes for it. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, but the slide is not moving. You're not seeing new slides? No. So you're still just seeing my title slide? Yeah. Okay, let me try this again. Let me try stop sharing and I'll share again. Okay. Okay, you see the title slide? Yes. yes. Okay. Is it moving? Uh, yeah, yes, now it's yes, okay. No, yes. Okay, sorry, you didn't miss much. So there's the zebra, there's... Uh, Something you know is this is this a mimic of uh, uh, of something that's more common? Are we making this up? Um, then we get to the survival, and then here we're we're caught up now. I apologize for that technical problem. Um, okay, and so uh, we estimate that there's perhaps one in 1.5 million live um, births um, we expect to have HLH, and so at a large children's hospital like Texas Children's, we estimate one in 3,000 um, admissions are HLH. So we see about 30 30 new cases a year. Um, and I think the question of HLH in the adult community is, um, is, is one that really remains undefined, and I look forward to hearing more about it later on in the talk. But you can see this, this is the number of hits for HLH in blue, and then for adult is in the, the orange color. And you can see, I don't think we're having an epidemic of adult HLH, rather, I think there's much more awareness for, for what the disease is. Um, and so we're trying to understand the disease. I think going to the original paper is, is very informative. So this is the, the first study from Farquhar and Claro in 1952, where they identified a single patient who had very uh, unusual features. So a nine-week-old baby um, uh, who was born, uh, uh, I'm sorry, at nine weeks developed a hyperinflammatory disorder and on autopsy in the spleen, they found these hemophagocytes. Interestingly, his sister um, the following year developed the exact same phenotype again at nine weeks of age. Um, some looks like some GI issues as well as the inflammation and they, they were very clever at that time they gave steroids I mean they gave ACTH and prolonged um, the, the, it's the sister survival for quite some time so this was the first sort of familial um, report of um, a hyperinflammatory syndrome that we've come to recognize as HLH um, and so when we talk about HLH frequently people um, discuss the diagnostic criteria so the HLH 2004 diagnostic criteria in fact describe these are um, inclusion criteria for a clinical trial, but they're sort of used as de facto um, diagnostic criteria for a disease. And it, it's, it's important to note that this hasn't really been prospectively validated. Nevertheless, this is, I think, how many of us think about HLH. So you have a patient with fever, you can develop splenomegaly, cytopenias, 
um, increased triglycerides, decreased fibrinogen, hemophagocytosis, this ferritin of 500, I think we'll talk about in a second, that's a bit too low. And there's some labs that are a bit more exotic, like getting IL-2 receptor and, and NK cell activity, or if you have gene mutations, that's also a criteria. And hemophagocytosis is part of the name, and it's really baked into what I think we, how we conceptualize HLH. And that's just um, uh, uh, these macrophages are um, uh, engulfing, um, engulfing other cells uh, within the bone marrow, within other tissue. So it's really these activated, very angry macrophages that are violating rules of personal space. Um, but it's important to note this is neither sensitive nor specific for HLH. HLH. It can arise from a lot of different conditions, um, but it's really, I, I think, a demonstration of the, the degree of inflammation that we see in HLH. So we worked on a, um, uh, a manuscript with the Cincinnati group uh, led by Mike, Michael Jordan uh, now almost 10 years ago, and I think um, Dr. Jordan really, I think, uh, conceptualized the diagnostic criteria in a way that makes sense to me, where you think of patients having some pre predisposing immune deficiency. So maybe your, your NK cells or T cells don't work, a genetic defect of cytotoxicity, family history, et cetera, et cetera. And that immune deficiency leads to the immune activation as evidenced by fever, splenomegaly, elevated ferritin, solid IL-2 receptor. Um, and that um, immune activation then leads to immune pathology. So that's where we see the cytopenias, we see DIC resulting in decreased fibrinogen, hemophagocytosis, et cetera. So I think really thinking about it in these terms helps also to understand the dynamic nature of the disease. And so you really have kind of issues with the host as well as immune challenges. And all of these different host factors um, are dependent on the developmental stage of the patient. And then the immune challenges really depend on the environmental or antigenic triggers that that, that, that host um, uh, comes in contact with. So let's talk about host factors for a second. There's a lot of um, discussion around familial versus secondary HLH, but I think that's not a particularly helpful question in the acute setting. Um, based on the HLH94 um, study, um, where really you just had to meet criteria for HLH, there was 55% survival for all comers and 51% survival for patients considered to have familial HLH. And so for HLH 2004, uh, 2004 Basically, it was considered, look, all HLH is, we'll call HLH, and then the questions of whether it's inherited or whether it's acquired um, really become more of an issue when you're trying to think about uh, issues such as bone marrow transplant downstream. But in the acute setting, they're not particularly helpful. And I think this, uh, th uh, these Kaplan-Meier curves demonstrate that. So here's all subjects, and you see this very high rate of death in the first several weeks. Um, and this is for, for all patients, and then this is just the familial patient. So there's not a big difference between familial or not proven familial. So the pathophysiology of HLH is um, comp complex, but I think one of the, the pathways that's really been well sorted out is sort of a, a defect in effector cell function, so cytotoxic T cell or NK cells. So these cells create cytotoxic granules that get packaged, then you punch holes in the infected target cell, uh, and then perforin with perforin and granzyme is is uh, injected into that cell to create apoptosis. And so virtually every step along this pathway has genes associated with it that um, have been associated with HLH. So for example, um, perforin, MUNC13, syntaxin, and Griselli syndrome, we have RAB27A, et cetera. But I think what's becoming um, uh, a little more complicated is just the, the, the factors involved in T cell function in general. So um, XLP, for example, um, and these other T cell um, uh, functional genes, um, when they're defective also can lead to HLH. And I'll talk a, a bit about how multiple immune deficiencies have recently been associated with HLH. So as one example, a European group did a, a large um, uh, kind of retrospective review of the, um, of the literature as well as an international survey, and they found really a high number of patients that had both HLH as well as associated um, primary immune deficiency, not cytotoxic defects. And so this really kind of um, challenges the paradigm. For example, if you have a skid, how can you have HLH without the L? Um, but, but I think um, uh, the vast majority of these are sort of more complex immune dysregulatory syndromes and complete absence of immune function. Um, and I think we're also getting more and more blurring of familial versus secondary HLH based on genotype, phenotype presentations. So I think um, we've all taken care of patients who have different types of mutations and, you know, a complete absence of perforin, you're going to see that patient in the first several weeks of life, where if you have a, a Griselli syndrome, for example, that might be a patient that has sort of smoldering disease over time. All right, what are the different immune challenges? So there's been a paper written about virtually every uh, immune challenge that exists um, being associated with HLH in patients. 
However, the most common is really EBV. Um, uh, and then we also have multiple viral, fungal, and bacterial challenges, malignancy, which I look forward to hearing about uh, in subsequent talk. Uh, again, immune deficiencies, both in, uh, intrinsic and acquired, can lead to HLH. So, you know, we have patients, for example, who are on chemotherapy who start to get some immune dysregulation or when they're getting immune reconstitution after transplant can develop HLH. And then we have synthetic HLH, which can occur in the setting of CAR T cells, for example, or checkpoint inhibitors. And then macrophage activation syndrome is how I kind of conceptualize um, autoimmune disease and HLH, although I think that definition um, is open to interpretation and, again, look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, later today. So why does EBV associate with HLH? And I think the most common model is that the infected EBV um, cells really serve as a T-cell irritant. So in most of us, we have EBV infection and then our T-cells really prune, prune those, that, that infection. And patients who have poor T-cell function, the T-cells are constantly being stimulated and, and the B-cells sort of overgrow like a like edge that isn't trimmed properly. And I think that's really what causes HLH in the setting of XLP, X-Men syndrome, and some other um, T-cell defects. Um, alternatively, you can have infected um, T-cells. And so I think this is really what we see more in Asia where you get the chronic active EBV. Um, in both settings, uh, early introduction of etoposide has been associated with improved outcomes. So I think really targeting those activated uh, and or infected T cells has been demonstrated to be helpful. So um, Michael Jordan did some, some uh, developed a mouse model of HLH. It's, it's a, a perforin deficient mouse that has, uh, when you infect with LCMV, develops an HLH-like phenotype. And I think the cytokine storm of really elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines across the spectrum has really been associated with HLH. And, but what Mike did, which was really clever, was to test each, each one of these um, cytokines with an antibody and see if that impacted uh, the survival of his mice. And interestingly, he found that while you had increased um, cytokines across the spectrum, uh, specifically blocking interferon gamma, um, uh, increase the lifespan of the mice. And that, that really is sort of what um, I think supported the concept of uh, interferon gamma blockade as a therapeutic strategy for HLH, which I'll talk about later. So again, how do we put all of this together? I think that there's lots of different paths to HLH, um, and it can be either a defective T cell or it can be immune, um, it can be persistence of, a, of antigen presentation. But either way, what ends up happening is you have this loss of homeostasis that leads to um, persistent interferon and then downstream um, um, inflammation. So just to go to an experience we had here at Texas Children's Hospital, when I was a fellow working with my, my mentor, Ken McLean, and we had one of these conversations in the ICU where we discussed, you know, how do you tell the difference between a HLH and severe sepsis? And we had this child with, with CMV infection who was 16 months old, who was rapidly deteriorating over a period of two days and, you know, on the vent getting uh, dialysis, et cetera. The ferritin was 10,000 and Dr. McLean made the comment, well, if ferritin's over 10,000, it has to be HLH. And, I kind of challenged him on this, but then uh, went back to our, our, our data from our, our own institution and looked at every case where ferritin was over 500 over the previous three years. And I found that Dr. McLean's intuition was in fact very, uh, very astute. As, as you can see here, HLH accounted for the vast majority of highly elevated ferritin. And in fact, the inflection point at uh, 10,000 gave the, gave the best sensitivity and specificity to about 90% sensitivity and specificity for HLH. Subsequent studies have, have improved on this number. And I, I've, um, I, I've worked with the, the German group and Kai Lumberg, and I, uh, we feel that maybe 2,500, 3,000 is a better cutoff point, but I think the point is if you have rising ferritin or elevated ferritin, it doesn't diagnose HLH, but it suggests a patient in whom HLH should be explored because patients with even very severe inf infections and, and shock typically don't have a uh, ferritin that high. Um, this led to some debate with our, within our own group. We got a letter to the editor from our own ICU team saying we need to, to look at this uh, further, and I'll, I'll address that uh, in a subsequent slide. So we, we extended that study really to look at um, a, a question of sort of when you're looking at HLH versus sepsis and SIRS, really which have very different um, uh, appropriate therapies, whether it's immune suppression, chemotherapy for HLH versus plasma exchange or just supportive care for SIRS and sepsis. Um, we asked the question, if you take plasma from these patients and we look across 130 different cytokines, is there a different plasma expression profile between these patients? And so you can see here's Healthy, um, healthy children, but then you can see unsupervised clustering really puts a lot of the HLH, sepsis, and SIRS patients together, and you can see this in a slightly different format here with, the, um, uh, um, with, with, um, with these plots um, where the healthy patients are over here and then the inflamed patients are sort of mixed together. Um, but if you specifically compare sepsis and SIRS versus HLH, 
what you find is that there is a classifier that differentiates with pretty reasonable sensitivity and specificity, so around 80, 85% sensitivity and specificity. And what's interesting is the, gene, the um, proteins, the plasma proteins that are highly associated with HLH are CXCL9, 10, and 11, which really are interferon gamma signature. So this is an unbiased assessment across 130 cytokines. And again, we, we see that the interferon gamma signature is much more prevalent in HLH. Um, and there's a similar story. I think if you look at probably a very similar population in, ad in adults, this was a, a massive study where um, uh, there, uh, patient, adults with severe sepsis were, were treated with anakinra or weren't treated with anakinra. It was, it was a randomized study and there was no difference in uh, the outcome of patients treated with anakinra or not treated with anakinra. However, if you split those patients into those with hepatobiliary dysfunction, so elevated D-dimers, clotting defects, et cetera, so features shared with HLH, we found those not receiving anakinra had a much um, lower survival rate compared to those who were treated with anakinra. So I think there is probably a role for a hyperinflammatory population among those um, septic patients who could also benefit possibly from immune modulation. So I'm not gonna talk much about this since it's coming up uh, in, a, in a future uh, discussion, but I think macrophage activation syndrome can be um, conceptualized as either autoimmune disease or, or other triggers that, that lead to um, HLH, so a persistent antigen trigger. So juvenile idiopathic arthritis and lupus are, are fairly common. However, it's not quite so straightforward because there, there are frequent hypomorphic mutations in perforin. In mice, if you give them persistent stimulation with TLR9, that can also cause, um, uh, that can also cause an HLH-like phenotype. Um, and it's also an important cautionary tale that when I went back through all the patients at TCH, that were diagnosed with um, uh, uh, familial defects uh, in HLH, the vast majority of them were first shown to, to are considered to have Kawasaki's disease when they presented to the emergency department. So I think it, 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 it's a complicated group of patients to, to look at. And also if you look at, here's a report from, um, from Randy Crone and, and Ed Behrens and some of the um, uh, leading rheumatologists in the US who, uh, did sequencing studies of patients with macrophage activation syndrome and found um, HLH associated mutations in quite a few of them. Um, and you can see this is a pretty severe cohort. Quite a few of these patients died from their disease. So I think differentiating autoimmune disease from HLH is, uh, and, and defining different um, risk groups is gonna be important. Um, and then there's some more mechanistic studies to really inform this. So activating NLRC4 and many other inflammasome um, mutations have been associated with, uh, with macrophage activation syndrome recently. Um, and it really looks like sort of the, the beginning, you know, whatever kind of fuels the flames can be different, but it really ends the same with sort of exuberant interferon gamma production leading to, to elevated cytokine storm. Um, again, we're, we'll hear about malignancy in HLH in a second. This is, this, is more, um, this is really more of an issue with adults than children, but this is a problem when you have patients who are treated with steroids for a significant period of time. They show up um, pre-treated, and then as we wean off HLH-94, sometimes, like in this case, we'll see subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma, ALCL, et cetera. So it's really important to consider and evaluate for cancer in patients with, um, with HLH. And then, of course, we have synthetic HLH. This seems to be a bit easier to manage because the, the cells are, are really more evanescent. They're more transient, but CAR T-cells, bites, and VUC cytotoxic T-cell lymphocytes, and also inhibitors have all been associated with cytokine release syndrome that uh, share some features with HLH. Um, so the genetics of HLH are really um, uh, interesting to me, and I, I, was, always, I was intrigued um, by a study where, where the Swedish group showed that um, in Sweden, um, initially they, they analyzed 13 patients who presented over six years with um, HLH, and they found that half of them, they could identify mutations. And then when they discovered the um, uh, intronic mutation in, UNC, in the monk gene, UNC13D, they really kind of solved the puzzle for the entire co uh, national cohort. Um, so I wanted to ask the question, well, how, how specific are the HLH diagnostic criteria in Texas? So we took 100 patients who met cl clinical criteria for HLH and performed whole exome sequencing or some other targeted sequencing to really say, like, are we making this up or, or, or how, how do these um, diagnostic criteria perform? And that's just kind of, this, this is a paper that we published in Blood, um, sorry, last year. Um, and you can, you can look this up for details, but basically this just kind of goes through the, the, the flow sheet. And what was really remarkable is in this cohort, only 20% of patients um, had defects in, in the familial HLH associated genes. However, the rest of these pies here um, were really quite um, surprising that we found um, primary immune deficiency um, associated genes or immune dysregulatory genes in the vast majority of these patients. And then 
this, and this part of the pie here is autoimmune disease and cancer. So really only 20% of the patients, we couldn't find a good reason for them to have had HLH. And if you break that down by years, you'll see that we are much more likely to find um, a familial HLH um, uh, mutation in, um, in younger patients. Um, although still beyond 12 years old, we still see it in some patients. Um, and then you can see <clears throat> if, you, if you analyze by, by, by trigger, again, we could only find patients without genetics, without an obvious trigger in a tiny, tiny fraction of these patients. So I think this really supports the concept that the HLH 2004 diagnostic criteria identify patients who are at very high risk for developing um, disease, a high risk of death and merit further investigation. Um, and so I think the other thing that, that this experience taught us was that we should probably look at sequencing sooner than later and looking at just the familial genes is probably not as efficient as just doing whole exome sequencing or a more targeted approach um, when we come across these patients. And this is becoming a bit more feasible. All right, so talking about therapy, um, you know, you can tell by HLH94, this was 1994. So it's been a long time that we've been using this approach of atopicide and dexamethasone. And the History Society piloted this approach where we give a toposide and dexamethasone with, um, as we decrease the dose, this is both therapeutic and diagnostic, and that as we start to decrease dex, sometimes we'll identify patients who flare. Um, and if they flare, this really suggests that they require continued immune suppression and eventually um, bone marrow transplant. Um, a toposide has been shown to be a really good T-cell, activated T-cell drug, and I think that's probably why it works well for HLH. It's a great drug, except as you give it longer and longer, by here you're starting to get cytopenias, and then if you give it too much over time, you can end up with risks of second malignancies. Um, and you can see that um, in 2000, HLH 2004, the question was asked, what happens if we give cyclosporin up front? And the bottom line is it's not really that different than um, HLH 94. It's not statistically different. So, um, uh, so we really believe that um, uh, giving HLH 94 is probably the most appropriate uh, therapy. So what do you do with patients who, um, who, um, who flare or aren't controlled with HLH 94? This is really problematic. And there's really been a paucity of literature to support what we do. Um, you can escalate doses of steroids, you can um, give other immune modulating drugs, but again, there's not a lot of literature to support uh, what to do next. So Rebecca Marsh organized a really nice series where um, we, we looked at the experience with alentuzumab or CAMPATH. And in this very, very high risk population, admittedly, this is a retrospective review and sort of a limited number of patients, but she, uh, we were able to achieve 70% um, survival in this patient group that's, that's very, very high risk. So CAMPATH is a, is a reasonable drug, um, although it, it bears um, significant infectious risks and has a very long half-life. So there's a question of when to transplant patients. So um, we typically advocate uh, transplant for patients who have fixed immune defects. Um, so proven inherited gene defects, strongly suspected of, um, or if you really suspect them of having an inherited gene defect. So younger patients, persistent NK cell dysfunction, or if they're in the ICU multiple times uh, or develop CNS disease, we believe that that's disease severe enough to really strongly consider transplant. Um, however, transplant outcomes are very, very poor. You can see there's this precipitous drop. Um, uh, and in the early days, this was really high, very high levels of treatment-related mortality due to the um, toxicity of transplant in these very fragile patients. And the Cincinnati group really pioneered using reduced intensity conditioning, so giving fludarabine, melphalan, and CAMPATH in this case. And this institutional cohort had this dramatic impact on, um, on overall survival although it was associated with um, challenges with poor long-term engraftment. So we recapitulated the Cincinnati experience in a national trial with the Blood and Marrow Transplant Clinical Trial Network. So we had um, uh, 46 subjects with HLH and a few other um, immune deficiencies. And you can see the outcome here. It's not ideal, but it's much better than, than the early days of 50% um, of survival. Um, uh, so while the survival was pretty good, the um, durable engraftment with the series was very, very poor, um, with um, uh, the majority of patients requiring e either top-offs or second transplants. So again, I think this is an area of investigation that we, that we need to continue to explore. All right, so looking for other um, possibilities for HLH salvage, I think there's a lot of excitement about the interferon gamma antibody, and I should say uh, I was on the um, steering committee of the um, 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 Novamune now, SOBI, um, uh, M and Palimab studies um, uh, as a disclosure. Um, so this drug was recently FDA approved because of the promising results that were just published about a month ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. 
and I'll briefly summarize those results. So first, how does emipalumab work? Well, it binds both um, free interferon as well as blocks, um, it blocks binding of the receptors and it also um, blocks dimerization of the interferon gamma receptors. So at multiple levels, blocks the ability of uh, interferon gamma to, to signal uh, through target cells. Um, I think this slide really shows the difficulty studying this patient group. So to, to create this open label single arm pivotal phase two, three study required a, a truly international effort um, uh, to recruit a sufficient number of patients. And also because the field didn't have a lot of um, salvage studies or no salvage studies to guide it, um, we had to kind of pioneer an approach to be able to evaluate um, the safety and efficacy of this drug. Um, so at least for the FDA approval, and, and, and as was written in the, um, the manuscript, there were 34 patients initially treated. So 30 per patients were alive at week eight, and 24 patients were alive at last follow-up. And I'll get, go into some of these details. So you can see these patients really represented the spectrum of uh, uh, genetic HLH. The vast majority of them had a genetic defect, so 80% um, had a, a cytotoxic um, um, inherited defect, and the patients were, um, were generally quite young. You can see one year's one year of age. And this kind of breaks things into patients who were treated as salvage versus patients who were treated as um, salvage plus um, um, frontline therapy. Um, and so you can see the efficacy here was, was quite good. The, so overall response rates of 64%. Again, this is all patients and this is for the salvage group. So here we break it down in, into complete responses, partial responses, um, and also um, um, partial improvement. Um, uh, and you can see that, that when we uh, applied these um, predefined criteria, they actually uh, correlated quite well with just the investigator assessment, which was the endpoint used for the HLH94 and 2004 criteria. So approximately 70% of the patients were deemed to, to be improved. And you can see that the Kaplan-Meier curves here are a bit um, more, um, not quite as precipitous as in some of the, the earlier, um, um, uh, earlier ex published experiences. Um, and you can see that they, they more or less um, mirror each other, whether it's frontline therapy or, um, or salvage patients. Um, as far as the safety of this drug, it proved to be actually quite safe. There was only one toxicity requiring discontinuation. One patient developed histo histoplasmosis, which is associated with interferon gamma activity. I think one thing to consider is also um, in your patients who, are, um, uh, who have tuberculosis, that would be another consideration. Oh, my goodness. I apologize, can you see my screen still? That's okay, no. Okay, so we had a little bit of a lightning strike here. Okay, Okay. so you can see the conclusions really are that based on the um, data from the study, Gamafant was approved by the FDA um, for adults and pediatric uh, patients with primary HLH with refractory recurrent or progressive disease or intolerance to conventional therapy. And so there's a follow-up study looking at, at how, um, um, how these patients um, uh, tolerate transplant. So interferon gamma is known to play a role in rejection and graftment and a lot of different things. And so it was unclear how interferon gamma would impact these patients. So these patients would receive interferon gamma up to where they started conditioning. They didn't get conditioning. They didn't get interferon gamma as part of their conditioning, but we did assess um, their responses. And you can see that these patients really had um, kind of whether they're in Europe or the US, they had reduced intensity or myeloablative conditioning. You can see they had sort of not a hugely favorable uh, donor pool. So this is sort of a, um, not an ideal donor group to be transplanted with. Um, and you can see T cell depletion was used in some cases. But despite all of those, uh, all those caveats, the transplant outcomes were actually quite good at about 90%, which again is, is quite favorable when you compare that to the um, BMTCTN data that I just showed you. Um, and so if you're going to compare those data, so we have 82% on the BMTCTN data. So this group had 90% overall survival, but strikingly the 40% of the patients who had durable engraftment, 77% of the patients had survival with durable engraftment on this study. So I think it's um, an interesting to, to look at the potential role of interferon gamma in, um, in, in transplant moving forward with these patients. Um, the other thing that's interesting is if you look, um, when, when they looked at the, um, uh, at the um, patients at day 100, there was detectable emipalumab all the way out to day 100. So I think even though they didn't receive any during conditioning, um, it was present during the transplant experience. So all of these data are a huge group of co-investigators um, uh, with a study run by Novamune, now Sobe, um, Michael Jordan, and Franco Locatelli were the PIs, and, and you can look more deeply at the data in the, in the New England Journal article. So there's, you know, are there more cytokine targets coming? I think there's more and more data about ruxolitinib. Um, there's interest in perhaps looking at, 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 um, at 
at tocilizumab and anakinra in, in other settings. Um, so I think what's happening now is we're really just now getting into looking at personalized diagnostic and, and therapeutic approaches to HLH. We're really, um, patients are defined by their immune defect, the, 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 the antigenic stimulus they, they encounter. And so, for example, peripheral mutation will show up in maybe week one of life, but if any of us get Ebola, or maybe now more relevantly, if we get uh, COVID infections, are we susceptible to developing pathologic inflammation? And so as far as nomenclature, there's a lot of discussion about this. I think it helps us as a field to think about this as rather than saying, you know, all these different types of HLH, say, look, we have pathologic inflammation due to X. And then our job is really to solve for X. You know, is it which of these immune defects, which of these antigenic challenges? All right, just very briefly, I'll, I'll talk about um, some, some association of inflammation and COVID. So I think... <clears throat> um, when the first patients with COVID were described from China, there was a lot of interest in some of these patients having a really inflamed kind of phenotype with um, some of the features of HLH. And there was sort of a thought piece written about this and in the Lancet uh, kind of speculating based on the cytokine storm that, that seems to be present in some patients is there a role for, for immune suppression. Um, and there was some more data coming from China that, that showed that, you know, in addition to some of these markers of heart disease, that CRP and IL-6 were associated with really poor outcomes. Again, leading to some concept of perhaps using um, uh, immune modulation. Um, and, <clears throat> uh -huh. excuse me, um, but there was also sort of a cautionary tale. Initially, there was, um, you know, a, a, another thought piece written in, in the Lancet saying, well, maybe we shouldn't be so fast to use immune suppression. When you look at cortico corticosteroid treatment across um, some of the previous, um, some, some of the previous um, COVID infections or coronavirus infections, it, it didn't prove to be helpful across the board. So we maybe shouldn't use this um, uh, as just sort of an automatic um, trigger. But I think the, the story with COVID is becoming more and more complex than the previous coronavirus infections. And there's, there's been some discussion about, especially in pediatrics, is there this association between COVID-19 and Kawasaki? And if, if we remember from our general pediatrics, Kawasaki is really just conjunctivitis, rash, edema, adenopathy, mucosal involvement. Um, it's pretty nonspecific, but it's um, you know, sort of a, a relatively frequent emergency room finding for pediatrics. Um, so a group from the UK reported this cluster of COVID-associated hyperinflammatory syndrome that had really features that had quite a lot of overlap with Kawasaki's, um, but the, the patients were a bit older. They had some features of heart involvement. Um, the ferritins were elevated, but not super elevated as in um, HLH. But interestingly, there was really only um, uh, detectable virus in two of these cases. And then they reported at the very last line of the paper that there was an additional uh, 10 or 15 cases or so. And in and, and all, there was about 50% of detected antibody. So is this a cluster that's really arising because of a COVID infection? Or are we looking at these patients differently as physicians because of COVID, I think was sort of a question. Although I think this pattern to be being reported more and more, such that it probably is truly a, a novel um, finding. Interestingly, there's some reports going way back the, from our own institution where we looked at atypical Kawasaki's and HLH, again, noting that the, the two have quite a lot of overlap and sometimes are nonspecific. And I put this picture here because I remember when I was a pediatrics resident, you know, you would be coached to ask people if they had their carpets clean because there's this big epidemiology study about carpet cleaner and Kawasaki's disease. But then it really led us to ask a question that, um, gave some sort of um, bias to the answer. And so th this association has been debunked. And so it, it makes me ask the question, are we, by looking for Kawasaki's, looking for something that's not really there, or is this truly disease? Um, and bearing in mind, like in New York City uh, last month, they really should have seen about five new cases of Kawasaki's a week. And so are these all, and if 20% of the, the children have COVID antibody, is this an association or a true um, uh, causal? And then for Kawasaki, similarly, why don't we see more reports of this in, in Asia? Why do we see these late presentations? I think there's still a lot of unsolved questions, additionally looking at mechanisms. How does endothelial injury play a role? What's, you know, why do we see these different phenotypes? Um, and there's been a lot published on this. So if you just look, last month I did this literature search and there were over 100 papers published on cytokine storm and COVID, but only seven of them had, had any data. So hopefully this, this number will increase and I think is, is, is due to increase exponentially over the next, um, over the next several months. But until then, I think it's interesting for us to, to hypothesize and speculate about associations. And I just wanna close with this slide. So this is again, a slide from the um, HLH versus sepsis, right? That I think not all cytokine storms are the same. So in, in HLH, we have interferon gamma elevated. In sepsis, we have IL-6 elevated. 
Um, I think it matters which cytokines are driving the cytokine storm and trying to figure out which those are is going to be important for each patient. And so as we wade through this disease, I think it may be a paradigm for um, autoimmune disease, sepsis, et cetera, as we move forward. You know, when does it make sense to blockade IL-1? When does it make sense to block IL-6? When does it make sense to block interferon gamma? And then there's these really compelling reports that so far are just in the press. I haven't seen anything in peer-reviewed literature, but there's perhaps some promise for dexamethasone for COVID, which again would be an interesting link back to, back to HLH. So I, I think as a community, our, our goal really is to get to precision immunology. So as we define these different phenotypes of patients, can we identify, well, what's wrong with this specific patient and say, you know, eventually say, okay, well, this patient has HLH due to CD27. And so, um, you know, certain specific therapy would be indicated, for example. All right, well, I appreciate your attention. I apologize if I, if I went over a few minutes and for the technical difficulties, but I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share this with you. I know I share a lot of patience with you and, um, and, and hopefully this is the beginning of a continued conversation. And I'll just, um, this is obviously a, a input from a lot of um, collaborators from multiple institutions. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Allen, for uh, this uh, nice lecture. Really, we enjoyed it very much. And uh, now it's the time to move to the second presentation. Uh, Dr. Abdullah Sumbul with us. Uh, he is going to talk about uh, macrophage activation syndrome. So please, Dr. Abdullah, if you can start now. You have 15 minutes. Okay. What's this? No, 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 this is not the one. Can you see it now? Yes, please. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay, salam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, yes. everybody, and thank you so much for the uh, organizing committee for this webinar for inviting me to talk about this important topic that I think with time it is uh, getting more recognized as an important cause of major mortality and morbidity. Uh, I think if we compare our experience like 20 years ago with now, uh, I think we are considering this possibility as one of the major differential, especially in those uh, patients with systemic inflammatory process. So uh, macrophage activation syndrome, probably Dr. or Prof. Um, Carl Allen has touched part on, on the macrophage activation syndrome. However, I'll, I'll try to go over this topic uh, probably in, in more details from our pediatric perspectives. So uh, as, as you know that HLH by itself is uh, an under-recognized hyperinflammatory syndrome. And in, in the literature now, people are using this terminology which is hyperinflammatory syndrome rather than specifying a type of um, like disease like HLH or macrophage activation because this terminology would encompass probably the whole uh, disease processes that has significant inflammatory process uh, leading to uh, significant um, morbidity mortality. But uh, just to, to brief it, uh, macrophage activation syndrome is being utilized when HLH is associated with aromatic disease, while if it is uh, triggered or, uh, secondary to other disease processes like malignancy or infection, people would use the terminology of secondary HLH. However, in our real practice, we might use these two terms interchangeably. Again, uh, it's by, by itself represent a, a very significant uh, diagnostic and management challenge, not only for pediatric rheumatologists, but even for you as hematologists. For again, infectious diseases, especially if you are dealing with somebody who's behaving like septic, and this share the same presentation with the uh, HLH or macrophage activation syndrome. Again, critical care people, I think, they started now realizing that this disease process is present and probably it was under-recognized and under-diagnosed and probably under-treated. That's why they are considering it, especially in critically ill patient. So, uh, as I said earlier, macrophage activation syndrome is considered as a severe hyperinflammatory reaction, where the, the abnormal hemophagocytes and macrophages are associated with abundant uh, production of cytokines, a state of hypercytokinemia, or what's called cytokine storm. 
Uh, th this sometimes might complicate an underlying severe systemic inflammatory disease, not necessarily um, pediatric uh, rheumatology diseases, but you could see it with any severe inflammatory process. Again, in, in pediatric rheumatology, it's most commonly secondary to systemic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And on the, our, the, the counterpart from adult side, the adult uh, onset stills disease. Uh, the serious thing about the mass that it could lead to end uh, or multi organ end organ uh, failures and uh, ultimate death if it's not recognized and treated uh, promptly. Uh, th this is uh, for me is an important slide which is summarizing all the hyperinflammatory syndromes. Uh, as you could see that the initial group is uh, the familial hemophagocytic lymphocytosis, which consists of uh, five types. Each of these were mapped and, uh, for a specific gene and uh, uh, protein. Uh, also, there is another group which is related to immune deficiency, including the Shidek Higashi, Graselli 2, uh, Hermansky Budlak, and the X linked lymphoproliferative disorders. And all these as well as being screened or uh, mapped for a specific genes. If you look here at the macrophage activation syndrome, this is probably a little bit an old slide. Uh, they put uh, unknown gene and unknown protein. However, the recent papers now are talking about uh, a reasonable uh, percentage of these patients who has gene identified. However, it's not a homozygous mutation. It's more of a heterozygous mutation. However, some of these genes associated with macrophage activation syndrome has major consequences about the presentation and the outcome. And in addition to these uh, three groups, the infection and malignancy associated hyperinflammatory syndrome are very important uh, consideration to be uh, addressed uh, in, in affected patients. I think the terminology, as Prof. Carl uh, has said, is still problematic because there is uh, confusion about the uh, different names. Um, sometimes people are using primary or secondary, familial, non-familial, reactive, acquired, then the terminology of macrophage activation syndrome has uh, came out and recently we started talking about the hyperinflammatory syndrome. So it is still, we don't have a unified uh, terminology or updated terminology between us and uh, you guys in, in hematology, which again would be very important to improve the clarity of the topic and probably enhance the future research. But as for now, we have the familial, which is uh, the, the, the one you are dealing with in, in hematology and the secondary or reactive, which is triggered by different uh, etiologies. And the difference that the familial is commonly presenting early in life in infancy, while the secondary type is presenting mainly in children, adolescents, and adults. Uh, it could even present in, in younger age groups. When it's, uh, again, appearing in the context of autoimmunity, the terminology of macrophage activation syndrome will be given. Again, why it's important, again, to, to talk about the terminology of, of these diseases, because if you look at the literature, this is probably earlier than what uh, Prof. Carl has, uh, has shown. You could see that since 1970 or 1980, there is a big surge of researchers talking about this important topics. Uh, this includes all the researches about the HLH and about macrophage activation syndrome. So this again would stress the need for having a more unified nomenclature rather than having separate names. So talking about mass um, per se, so this, this syndrome was described early uh, in 1980s in children complicating severe systemic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis by the group in uh, Toronto and, and Sicket. Uh, then uh, the name of macrophage activation syndrome was given by Stephen et al. Then it was emerged in, uh, in, in parallel with the development of histocyte society classification of histocytic disorders in 1987. What about the mass in pediatric rheumatology? So it's been reported almost in association with any rheumatic disease. However, the most common and well recognized uh, is the patients who are affected with systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, about 80% of the uh, reported cases for in the literature are uh, associated with systemic onset GIA. However, talking about the offered clear, full-blown um, macrophage activation syndrome, it's seen around 10% of systemic onset GIA. And I think the percentage has been changing since now there is an early use of um, biologics or the interleukin a block it early in the disease process, which would probably help in uh, decreasing the number of those who are affected with um, offered mass. But those who get subclinical mass, uh, would, the, the percentage would, would go up to uh, 30%, uh, especially in those who get active disease, but they wouldn't have the full-blown 
um, severe disease uh, of macrophagic patient syndrome. Overall, the mass, again, in pediatric rheumatology is still under-recognized, uh, including the group of systemic on CGIA. But remember that you could see it with any, any severe inflammatory process. We have seen cases with Kawasaki and with systemic onset of systemic lupus erythematosus. And we have seen even cases of juvenile dermatomyositis. And in the literature, it's been even reported with O2 inflammatory, severe O2 inflammatory uh, syndromes or periodic fever syndromes. This is, uh, again, a continuation of the previous slide. And the, the idea of this is just to stress about the importance of having the different triggers for the uh, secondary or um, mass-like disease. Uh, so in pediatric rheumatology, the top or the adult rheumatology onset uh, stills disease, lupus or Kawasaki disease. If you talk about infections, viruses are the most common triggers, especially the Epstein barr virus. Uh, if we go for malignancy, it is commonly associated with hematological malignancies, but remember that treatment per, uh, by itself, like chemotherapy, biologic therapy sometimes might be a trigger, or sometimes the DMAR that we use in our practice might be sometimes triggering uh, macrophage activation syndrome or secondary HLH. Uh, briefly, what, what, what is the issue with, uh, with mass? Uh, just to make it simple, the issue is defective cytolytic um, uh, process, which is mainly the, the function of the innate system by the NK cells and the adaptive system by cytotoxic T cells. So they will not deal with tumor or infected cells. That's why these will be presented as antigen to the antigen presenting cells, which would result in activation of T cells with production of cytokines. Another part of this is related to T regulatory cells, which are very important type of cells, mainly in the autoimmune diseases, because this would work as a control file for the self tolerance. So it would prevent the production of excessive cytokines from lymphocytes, and it would prevent the proliferation of T cells. So if this one is defective, you would find increased production of lymphocytes, uh, of the, of the um, uh, cytokines or other inflammatory markers, including interferon gamma, and you would find a lot of proliferation of lymphocytes. And that by itself, especially through the interferon gamma, would uh, proliferate or would stimulate the proliferation of histocytes. And the resultant uh, end of this would be the hemophagocytosis and an excessive production of the cytokines, which would result in the cytokine st storm, then the hyperinflammation. So the pathophysiology, in, in brief, it would be failure of normal cytolytic function of NK and uh, CTL, CTLs. Then there will be inability to clear antigens from the infection, malignant cells, or from autoimmune or autoinflammatory processes or immune complexes. Then you would have inappropriate immune stimulation and self uh, hyperinflammation state known as cytokine storms. Then eventually there will be inappropriate survival of the histocytes and cytotoxic T cells, which would lead to more production of cytokines and secondary hemophagocytosis with end organ damage. Talking about genetics, uh, if you remember the initial table when it was said that it's unknown to have any genetic predisposition for mass, now there is increased prevalence of heterozygous mutation. Uh, in, in the uh, known familial HLS genes found in uh, macrophage activation syndrome patients. And it's been found, which is the, the most important thing, that the fatal mass or secondary HLS was found in those who had heterozygous mutation of these two genes, which is very commonly found in primary HLS. So the presence of these genes will be very important, at least for the outcome. Uh, so the presence of the, the, the mutation in these genes would probably give you a more aggressive type of macrophage activation syndrome. To summarize all these, so here we have multiple factors, including genetic factors, whether it's related to innate or to the adaptive immunity. We have immunosuppression that we might use sometimes for our diseases. Methotrexate, for example, among the group of DMARs is being reported that it might induce macrophage activation syndrome. And in the group of biologics, there are a couple of reports about etanercept or tumor necrosis factor uh, alpha blocker, which is inducing the macrophage activation syndrome. Uh, Prof. Allen has talked about probably chemotherapy that it might induce the HLH. And as we said earlier, the severe inflammatory process uh, might be sometimes a good stimulus for the production of the cytokines, in addition to the well-known 
uh, triggers uh, of infection, especially the AB4 virus. What would we expect in, uh, in labs? So they would have uh, features of systemic um, inflammation. So they might have non-relapsing sustained fevers. You might find organomegaly or lymphadenopathy. In severe cases, central nervous system dysfunction uh, and disorientation might be there. Hyperferritinemia, I think this is a very important finding that might probably be an initial clue for diagnosis. Pancytopenia, especially in the context of systemic onset GIA, because the typical thing that we see in systemic onset GIA that they would have significant leukocytosis, significant thrombocytosis, and anemia. So if you have pancytopenia in a context of systemic onset GIA, then this is uh, a good consideration to be put in your differential. Consumptive coagulopathy mimicking the IC, again, this is very important. And once it happens, that it might indicate that you are dealing with um, a missed case of, uh, of mass, because that might be one of the uh, late manifestations. Elevated liver enzymes, I think, along with bancytopenia, might be an initial, good initial clue for diagnosing mass. So what is the status now? Are, are we now starting to recognize the tip of iceberg? I think this is what's happening. Uh, not only just in pediatric rheumatology, but if, if you have a hospitalized patient who is febrile, and he has multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, or he has a SIRS or severe inflammatory response syndrome, with negative or even positive, even those who are septic, and you find very high ferritin. So are we looking at the tip of the iceberg? And these are predisposing these patients to have this cytokine storm, which would present as uh, the, the terminal part of this disease process. So always we need to think about the underlying um, triggering factors uh, causing mass or secondary HLH. So diagnostic criteria, I think this is one of the difficulties in uh, diagnosing mass or uh, HLH, especially talking about secondary HLH, which we are dealing with. Unfortunately, we don't have any single pathognomonic uh, feature of mass, so it is not a clinical diagnosis, or you don't have a, a set of universal diagnostic criteria. However, there are some consensus panel which was performed in 2016, and uh, Dr. Raffaele and his group published a set of validated classification criteria that was aimed uh, to help distinguishing the systemic GIA flare from the macrophage activation syndrome. And that set of criteria has a sensitivity of around 73% and specificity of uh, 99%. Uh, the, the initial uh, 2004 HLH criteria, uh, if you follow that one in, in, in the group we are treating, I think that the diagnosis might be delayed uh, and you might miss a, a reasonable number of patients. I think this is a good table that is comparing the three important uh, diagnostic criteria. So this is the original HLH, uh, which was published in 2004, and uh, I'll probably describe it. But the two important thing for us is the print two criteria by the, Dr. Raffaele and his group. And uh, simply, uh, it is for those who get established systemic onset GIA or they are suspected to have systemic onset uh, GIA if they have a high level of ferritin, more than 684, uh, along with two or more of the remaining, including the fever, platelet count, high liver enzymes, hyper triglyceridemia or hyper five or hypo fibrinogenemia, then that might um, uh, be enough to diagnose uh, macrophage activation syndrome and systemic GIA, even without the need for having um, bone marrow aspiration. Uh, in adults, they, uh, there is uh, something called HS score, uh, which was initially published in 2014 by Dr. Fardet. And each of the manifestations related to uh, HLH would be scored according uh, to the degree of elevation. For example, for fever, if you have low-grade fever, it is zero. If you have high-grade temperature, it would be 49. And the same will apply for the others. So if you have a score of more than 169, this would make the diagnosis of HLH, secondary HLH, more prob probable uh, with a sensitivity of 93% and specificity of 86%. Uh, a, a Turkish physician has applied the H score even on pediatric age groups. In, in, uh, in one of his studies, and he found that the ultimate uh, diagnosis of patients by using this criteria was better than the original criteria of HLH, which was published in 2004. But the, the, the thing that they increased the score from 169 to 190. So on uh, one large prospect, retrospective study, which was applied in 2016, which was the time for the uh, criteria which was uh, 
suggested for systemic on GIA um, associated mass. This criteria was uh, applied for patients who got lupus, uh, who were admitted to a hospital with fever, and they found that one third were classified to having mass based on the criteria which is adopted for systemic onset GIA. Of those, 35% died compared to only 3% without mass. So uh, they, they concluded from that study that the classification criteria could be used in patients with systemic uh, lupus erythematosus and fever, and it would help in uh, identifying a group of uh, mass patients and probably initiating the therapy uh, appropriately. This was a proposed diagnostic criteria for mass, complicating systemic uh, lupus erythematosus, which was published earlier than even the proposed criteria for systemic cancer GIA. This was published in 2009, and uh, it was studied on 38 um, patients. Uh, and they found that apart from fever, all the other manifestations were more in the group of mass uh, patients compared to lupus patients. The difficulty here that lupus usually would have in, in, uh, in active disease, they might have pancytopenia, they might have high liver enzymes, which sometimes might be confused with mass and it might delay the diagnosis. So the diagnosis here was proposed if you have one clinical and two laboratory, or if you have an evidence of uh, macrophages in um, a bone marrow aspirate. Ferritin, I think this is a very important part. And in our practice, we started uh, ordering ferritin in any patient presenting with severe inflammatory process, especially if he's fibrine, uh, because the hyperferritinemia is a very important key fa factor or feature that we, are, we use uh, to look for these patients. So the, the, the serum ferritin is very important because it is linked to disease activity. And if you are putting a patient on treatment, the CPL measurement is very important uh, to monitor the response to your treatment. The, uh, it's, it's been found in studies that the maximum serum ferritin levels during the secondary HLH and the fall of less than 50% after treatment was associated with higher mortality. In a single center, there was a retrospective review of serum ferritin, and they found those who got a ferritin level more than 10,000 has 96% uh, specific and 90% uh, sensitive um, tool to uh, diagnose HLH on a timely manner. Dr. Sample, you have one minute. Only one minute? Only one minute. Okay, so uh, ferritin, I think, is very important. Another thing is ferritin to ESR ratio. So, uh, it's been found that if you have high ferritin, ESR ratio, that would increase the specificity for diagnosing mass. Uh, in, in adults, they are using ferritin as a marker, so it's uh, very important. I'll just go quickly over the treatment. The treatment uh, is uh, very important to consider sto steroid because it's the corner store of, of treating these patients, their active or acute presentation the steroid high dose by using intravenous methylprednisolone pulses. Sometimes it might, might be enough alone, especially if you have a mild disease. Historically, cyclosporine was most frequently used second line treatment. We use it sometimes in patients uh, uh, as, as adjunctive therapy to steroid. IVIG sometimes might be added, especially if uh, you have severe or refractory cases. The most important treatment is the cytokine specific therapy, and the commonly used one is anakinra, which is very, very effective uh, drug, and we are seeing excellent results uh, by using the anakinra, uh, especially in, in, in early initiation, because it's been found in studies that if it's initiated after day five, that the uh, mortality would be, would be more. The other therapies would be kanakinumab, which is a long-acting interleukin-1 antagonist, and tocilizumab, we used it in two patients since uh, during the period when anakinra was not available, and we have good results, but there are sometimes uh, more promising results uh, coming from other therapies. We have a couple of case reports talking about etanercept as uh, effective therapy, however, uh, we don't see a good effect in controlling the systemic manifestation, so we, we don't use it as a therapy for, uh, for mass in these uh, patients. Uh, we have uh, an evolving medications. Uh, Prof. Uh, Carl has talked about the imabulumab, and uh, there is JAK-STAT inhibitors, which is coming in the way. Lastly, I'm talking about the uh, interleukin-18 binding protein. So interleukin-18 is a very important uh, mediator of inflammation in mass. So there are a uh, few case reports talking about the effectiveness of using this recombinant binding protein uh, in uh, one case in uh, combination with anakinra, and the other one it was used as a single uh, drug with uh, very uh, uh, encouraging results, especially that it was used in a refractory mass. 
So in adults, there, there is nothing uh, validated. However, we, they use more or less what we use, which is using the high dose steroid plus IVIG. If that one did not work, the Anakinra will be the second choice. If it didn't work, probably part of the HLH uh, treatment uh, using TB16 or atubicide might be an important thing uh, to consider. Just to sum up. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I will start with Dr. Allen. Uh, I have uh, the first uh, question. Any ongoing clinical trial for secondary HLH uh, or mass? Um, so I think uh, my rheumatology colleagues might be better able to, um, to answer that. Um, is, I know that there are clinical trials with um, drugs blocking IL-18, um, emipalumab, um, uh, and I suspect other um, targeted therapies for, for pediatric MAS, but um, I have to confess I, I am not completely um, sure which ones are open and what the eligibility criteria, but I, I'm happy to see an increasing number of trials um, in this space. Okay. Uh, the second question, um, uh, is there, uh, what is the outcome of imablumab uh, in comparable to uh, HLH 2004 uh, uh, protocol? I guess I think uh, if, if it's used alone. Um, that's a good question. I think, um, so, so emipalumab study was primarily in patients who had failed upfront therapy, so it's not a completely com um, comparable um, um, study. So I, I guess I would invite people to, um, um, to, to look at the recent um, New England Journal article to kind of see the, the very specific differences in, or, or comparisons in patient populations. Um, but the, um, the overall survival in um, HLH-94 and um, 2004 is some, somewhere along the lines of um, 60, 70 percent, um, and the um, the the Kaplan-Meier curve or the overall survival is is similar in the um, uh, emipalumab trial. But again, it's you can't really compare them because um, it wasn't a head-to-head -head study, and the disease groups were different. The patient groups were different. Okay. <laughs> what is your experience in using uh, Anakirra in primary HLH or familiar HLH? Um, so our, our rheumatology colleagues use Anakinra quite a lot. Um, I think it seems to be effective in patients who have autoimmune associated um, um, macrophage activation syndrome or HLH. I think it's a reasonable thing to try frontline in patients who have symptoms while we're sorting out the, um, um, the diagnosis. Um, un unfortunately, all the data right now is a sort of anecdotal, so I, I think that different centers use it differently, um, but I think that, you know, among steroids um, and targeted cytokines, um, it's, a, it's one of those that's frequently used, and there's some reports of, of good outcomes um, or responses, but, um, but again, there hasn't been a prospective trial looking at patients who have gene-proven HLH and, and what those responses would be. Okay, and uh, can you comment in the use of steroid in COVID uh, cytokines release syndrome? Yeah, it's interesting. So as, as I showed, there, there was some early um, kind of comparison or uh, meta-analysis of previous coronavirus infections where steroids possibly could have been harmful. I think in, in the whole field of sepsis, um, the question of whether steroids are harmful or helpful is, is a challenging one. And I think the bottom line is it depends on the, the group. Um, um, I mean, there's a lot of excitement around the press release that dexameth a, a trial out of UK showed that dexamethasone um, in critically ill patients was helpful. And I think we all look forward to um, reading the peer-reviewed um, data around that. I think uh, we'll move to Dr. Sombol. I have uh, two questions for Dr. Sombol. Uh, can uh, COVID trigger uh, uh, primary, uh, sorry, it's uh, not so uh, Dr. Sumbul, what are the differences between mass and uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children in terms of pathophysiology? Well, I, I don't think now the, the multi-system inflammatory disease pathophysiology is well known. However, if you read about it, uh, probably people are talking about the uh, interleukin-6 as a predominant inflammatory mediator. Uh, while in uh, mass, you have multiple immune mediators, uh, predominantly the interleukin-1 and the uh, interferon gamma. Uh, however, now as a therapeutic uh, option, probably to probably according with what's being published, is uh, 
is showing good results in the multi-system uh, inflammatory disease. Uh, while probably it's not the top um, uh, like drug to be used uh, in, in, the, in mass. Anakinra probably is a superior drug that we consider before uh, tocilizumab. Uh, another question, what do you think, what, what is the main difference between HLH and MAS? Well, I, I, I personally, I think they are representing the same spectrum of disease. However, uh, if you are talking about secondary uh, HLH, I, I think the, the name is the same. But uh, even when we uh, started recognizing this entity when I was in Toronto, people were using the same terminology or secondary HLH or MAS. Uh, so there is probably both physiologically no major difference between the two. Uh, however, I think now with the more popular use of gene testing, um, at least from the whole exome sequencing, uh, I think we might figure out some differences. But clinically, I think they are behaving the same. So uh, I have one question. What is, what is the significance of uh, monoallelic uh, genetic mutation in, uh, in mass? Um, uh, from what I read, that even if, if you find it in like a heterozygous mutation, they said this, this would uh, probably increase the significance of this, uh, this type of mutation. And as I said in my slides, that this is linked mainly to a more severe form of disease. This is what, what I, uh, I know, but probably if, if Prof. Carl could, could comment on this, uh, because I think it's, it's the same uh, principle in uh, Chilech. Yeah, okay. So if you can comment, Dr. Carl, and then we'll have a couple of questions also. Uh, Dr. Ahmadi, I'm also ready for my slides afterwards. Thank you, Carl. So the question about um, monoallelic disease well, in HLH. Mean. I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, yes, um, yes. yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. It, um, I think that it, it's, uh, I think there are reports that show mo patients with monoallelic mutations that probably contributes to their disease, but there, when, as we get increasingly um, more whole exome sequencing, there's a lot of variants of uncertain significance we're not sure what to do with. And so I think um, really a prospective trial with sort of careful functional mapping is probably gonna be important to figure out which mutations on which genes um, may be biologically important. Um, so I think that it's, um, it's something that, uh, we should certainly pay attention to, but I, I think it, it helps to also look at sort of functional assays, um, especially in monk, which is a huge gene, um, before we sort of declare that the cause of somebody's um, HLH. I will take uh, one question and then we'll move to uh, Dr. Salama presentation. Uh, can I diagnose HLH without splenomegaly uh, uh, with the presence of other uh, criteria? Yeah, so, so the, um, the diagnostic criteria, there's no diagnostic criteria that's um, 100%. Um, you know, some, some are more um, sensitive and specific than, than others. But yeah, I would sort of have to take a look at the, at the patient's, um, um, patient as a whole and try to, to see if the um, uh, you know, predisposed to immune deficiency, immune activation, or pathologic um, inflammation are playing a role. Adi, do, do you allow me for a question for Prof. Carl, if you don't mind? Uh, can we take it uh, after the, this presentation? Yeah. Go ahead, okay. go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Salama, can we start now? You have... Uh, yeah, yes, public... we can. I'm really, I'm really sorry for this inconvenience. I will talk uh, briefly about secondary, adult, uh, secondary HLH in adults. Yeah, Other introduction. If you, yes. If you can just <laughs> brief in 10 yeah, to 12 minutes. I will try minutes. to finish in 15 minutes. So, uh, 15 minutes, okay? So uh, before HLH is used to be a disease of children, uh, of young children. However, over the last 10 years, more frequently HLH is being diagnosed in adults. Most likely this is because of more awareness about HLH. The mean age of presentation in adults is 49. However, it can occur at any age and it's more predominant in males. 63% of adult HLH are males and the rest are females. Next slide, please. Okay, regarding the pathogenesis, HLH is an apparent hyperinflammatory immune response syndrome driven by T cell and induced cytokine storm. Secondary HLH pathogenesis is mainly due to inability of the immune system to restrict stimulatory effect of different triggers. So there must be a trigger. Next slide. 
Next slide, please. Yes. So uh, causes of secondary HLS or the triggers, the most important is malignancy associated HLH. It accounts for the majority of adults who presented with HLH and it's the most serious and the most cause of this in, in secondary HLH. Other causes will be infection, uh, bacterial, EBV virus, which, uh, which can be a trigger also for children and adults, HIV, CMV, fungal infections, and intracellular infections like leishmaniasis, rickettsia, TB, and influenza. The third category, uh, which Dr. Sumbul already talked about, which is the mass, secondary to autoimmune disease, uh, and also uh, novel uh, agents such as uh, CD19, CAR-T, and uh, uh, PD-1A inhibitor can cause a cytokine release uh, syndrome similar to HLH. It's reported also post-organ post transplant or post-stem cell transplant. And in, uh, in post-stem cell transplant, it will be a clinical dilemma because most of the cases it's missed, missed because it mimics GVHD or infection. That's why most of the transplant, some of some transplanters suggest to do regular serum ferritin after transplant so as not, not to miss this case. Uh, I will talk briefly about malignancy associated HLH. It accounts for 40 to 70% of adult HLH. It is the most aggressive type of secondary adult HLH and it carries high mortality rate. 50% of secondary HLH is due to hematological malignancies. Lymphoma is the most common cause, especially certain types of lymphoma, such as NK cell and preferred T cell lymphoma. They account for 35% of malignancy associated um, uh, HLH in adults. B cell lymphomas, 32%. EBV lymphomas, leukemia, 6%. Uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, 6%. And solid malignancies, 3%. Usually, as uh, Prof. Carr said in his um, lecture, there will be the diagnostic difficulties, whether for the lymphoma itself or for the HLH. Because uh, when an adult presents with high serum ferritin, pancytopenia, fever, it, uh, it might be attributed to the lymphoma and the HLH will be missed. Or the other way around, if a patient who is already diagnosed as HLH receives steroid, then the lymph node will be masked and it will be difficult to diagnose. So most of the time, we need repeated biopsies uh, and high clinical awareness. However, uh, uh, high soluble CD25 to ferritin ratio is suggested by HLH expert to uh, suggest lymphoma rather than infection or other secondary causes. So this could be used as a parameter to indicate underlying lymphoma. PET is the gold standard uh, test uh, for malignancy associated uh, lymphoma, HLH. I will uh, go through this case briefly because uh, it happened that we, we, have, we have this patient admitted under us now uh, this, uh, this month. And this is a typical presentation of an adult who presents with HLH. So he's the one year old gentleman presented 10th of June 2020 with two months history of right facial swelling and pain in addition to fever. Next slide. So uh, he didn't, uh, uh, we didn't consent him to take uh, the picture of the full face but he had right uh, facial swelling that is similar to the picture when you see, with nasal uh, type lymphoma or such uh, types of lymphomas. In addition to this buccal lesion and the hard palatal whitish lesion, uh, in addition to um, small cervical lymph nodes and the tip of the spleen was palpable and he was febrile. This is his PET scan. Uh, it showed activity in the face and nose and there is no other, way, other uh, activities elsewhere. If you look at his labs, the next slide, can you see it? Uh, if you look at his lab from the presentation to start with, before we start chemotherapy, he has pancytopenia, white count of 3.2, then down to 1.6. He had a hemoglobin of 8, 7, 6, platelet 63, 29. So he had pancytopenia. He had low fibrinogen level, 1.49, and the lowest is 1.2. He had high triglyceride, and the serum ferritin strikingly was more than 40,000. So we suspect HLH, and we did for him bone marrow, despite that the PET did not show any activity down, but we did the bone marrow to roll out HLH. And here is his bone marrow. It showed evidence of HLH, but there is no lymphoma. And the biopsy from his buccal lesion showed nasal type NK lymphoma. So now he's under treatment for both HLH and lymphoma. To diagnose adult HLH, um, the diagnosis for adult is usually misdiagnosed as acute sepsis. That's why uh, clinical awareness and orientation is needed. Delayed diagnosis and treatment have dismal outcome. Of course, uh, Dr. both Dr. Sumbul and Dr. Carl talk about the HLH uh, 2004. I will not talk about it. However, uh, I will just uh, uh, mention something that um, 
although it's widely used by adult physicians, uh, the back, back yes, HLS is on. Although it's wide, widely used by adults, the serum ferritin, for example, which is taken as one point, and uh, which both of the speakers before they mentioned, it had, has high specificity and uh, sensitivity uh, to, uh, to children with uh, HLH. However, this is not the case in, in, uh, in adults. So in adults, it's not way the, the, the same 92% uh, sensitivity specificity. So, um, and the other thing, the other backdrop of the 2004 in adults, that it did not contain the transaminitis, the high liver function test, which is a common presentation in adults. So that's why there is a need for another scoring or diagnostic uh, tool uh, in adult. The H score uh, probability calculator is it's available online and it has certain parameters. Also, I will not talk much about it, but it includes the AST in the parameters and it's used mainly for secondary HLH rather than primary. I applied for my patient, the one that I talked about before, it gave me 268 a point, which is more than 99% probability of HLH. And the interesting thing, they added also a statement here, uh, whether you decide whether your patient has uh, COVID suspected or unlikely, and then they will give you treatment recommendation. I found it so easy to apply and uh, 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 yeah, quick, quick parameter because it, you can download it in your mobile and use it. Uh, there is a French-Belgium study compared the H score probability to uh, HLH uh, 2014, four, sorry, uh, and it was found that HLH is more efficient in both children and adults uh, to diagnose um, uh, HLH. Despite that, still HLH 2004 is the one that is used widely. Next slide, please. So for adults, we don't need the full uh, presentation, whether the, the full criteria, we don't need the criteria, whether in H score or in, we just need the Bentad. Whenever, whenever somebody came with sepsis, fever, uh, DIC, uh, high liver enzymes, cytopenias, think of it and try to search for it. Otherwise, multi-organ failure and death. Next slide, please. So regarding the pretreatment evaluation, it's mainly from our uh, published Saudi guidelines for uh, for uh, histocytic disease, including HLH. We uh, publish the guidelines, including management and invest uh, investigation and management. I will not go through the history in details, physical examination, investigation, we divide it into three parts. Investigation to diagnose HLH, which is uh, what you know, the CBC, liver function, uh, soluble CD25, ferritin bone marrow biopsies, as well as the mutational analysis. For the mutational analysis, we don't do it routinely for all adult patients because of the fact that primary HLH is not common in adult as in pediatric. Uh, we do it only if there is family history of HLH, if there is a history of previous attack of, uh, of, uh, of HLH, or if we did not find a clue or a cause or a trigger, uh, then we sent for it, especially that it's sent out, it's not done in our hospital or uh, in our area. Uh, uh, also knowing that a familiar HLH is very rare in adults. However, the birth one gene mutation was detected in 10% of healthy uh, whites without having any HLH manifestation. Next slide, please. So also after you uh, diagnose HLH, you need to do investigations to identify the cause, a PET scan and CT. We do it for every adult patient who presents with HLH, tissue biopsies, if a lesion present. Sometimes you only find uh, splenomegaly and no other lymph nodes plus the HLH. And uh, there is suspicion of lymphoma from the history or so. So splenectomy is indicated uh, if there is no other lesion to biopsy and the soluble CD25 to ferritin ratio is high to rule out lymphoma and to diagnose lymphoma. We do EBV, BCR, CMV, uh, HIV for every patient. If we suspect TB, we do TB. Lishmanesis and rickettsia are not common here in, in our area. Autoimmune screen also we do it. Blood and urine culture for every patient. Other investigation based on the manifestation. So if there is CNS manifestation, we do MRI and CSF. We need to be very cautious with the CSF because of the coagulopathy that those patients present with. HLA typing, we do it for every patient who can be a candidate for transplant in the future because if they are refractory or relapsed or tend to be primary, we will do the transplant. So how about management of adult HLH? Most of the recommendations for management of adult HLH are mainly driven from pediatric literature and expert opinion. Saudi guidelines for management of adult histocytic disease, including HLH, were created in 2018, and it was also adopted from pediatric guidelines and adult histocytic disease expert literature. So when we talk about the management of, of uh, HLH, HLH 94 came to our mind. 
So this is a protocol which is widely used, used but due to the heterogeneity of the HLH, one size protocol does not fit all, okay? So we offer HLH-94 to patients who are uh, from 14 to 18, regardless of the cause, because in our institution, we treat patients from 14 to 18 as adults, so those, we treat them the same as the pediatric protocol, we offer HLH-94. Or if it's primary, no, no cause was found, or, idiopathic, or there is family history or refractory, then this is the time when we give HLH-94 to start with. However, the doses of etobicide are modified according to the age and renal function. We don't go by the 150 usually. We go, we go by a dose of 50 to 100 milligram per meter squared. And sometimes we reduce the dose from twice weekly to once weekly. Next slide. So I will summarize just the management recommendation in one slide. I will not go through them one by one. So once the diagnosis of HLH, of, of HLH is made, Search for the cause, but don't wait for the cause. Start because this is fatal, because the mortality is very high, uh, the time here matters. So we start IV and uh, IG, immunoglobulin, and the steroid plus minus cyclosporine, and we search for the cause. We give the IV IG uh, one to two gram uh, per kg for one to three days. This is, this is uh, sometimes enough to settle the cytoka cytokine storm for a while, till the cause is identified. So if we identify the cause, if the cause is infection, we give IV IG plus antimicrobial, Lishmanase is TB, we give directed therapy plus IVIG. Uh, malignancy associated HCLH, we usually give chemotherapy directed to the type of lymphoma, but we incorporate usually the isoposide whenever possible. Like if we give CHOP, we give CHOIP, we give those adjusted EPOC. Or for my patient, we give the SMILE that is um, sensitive, uh, that is uh, specific for NK lymphoma and contain etoposide. If it is autoimmune disease, I think this is covered by Dr. Sumbul. If it is EBV, IV, IG, and rituximab. And if we did not find the cause, as I said, or primary, we give HLH-94. Can we move to the other slide? Next. So we don't forget about the supportive therapy, correct coagulopathy, correct anemia and thrombocytopenia. I would say platelet more than 50 sometimes would be difficult. I would say more than 330. Uh, avoid GCSF in active HLH because of the reported, uh, reported to cause capillary leak syndrome. However, this is not a solid evidence in adult, and we weigh uh, risk versus benefits. So if we give extensive chemo protocol that cause cytopenia, we usually give the GCSF and watch for the HLH uh, signs. Of course, treat infection. Um, antiviral is recommended for all patients because they have T cell uh, defect. Antifungal or PCB prophylaxis is only for those who are on HLH protocol or those who have a prolonged uh, cytopenia. Next slide. How about relapse refractory? Uh, if they did not have the HLH-94 in the induction, we give them HLH-94 followed by allogenic stem cell transplant. Tuzumab uh, is studied in pediatric with refractory relapse HLH and 77% of them managed to go to allo stem cell transplant. Also, it's recommended uh, to bridge the patient to transplant or to control the disease. Also, there are studies, as my colleague said, uh, on JAK inhibitors, roxolitinib. Plasmapheresis is preserved for very critically ill patients. And uh, imapolumab is also, uh, which is approved for refractory, primary HLH in children and adults. And also there are studies, ongoing studies on secondary HLH, so it can be also an option. Next. Role of stem cell transplant. We transplant usually the familiar, idiopathic, or refractory, despite chemoimmunotherapy. Uh, for the conditioning protocol in children, it was proved that RIC is better than uh, myeloablative, 43% to 92% overall survival. However, in adults, uh, and the, the EBMT study did did the study, EPMT group did a retrospective study and it did not show the same uh, superiority. There was no difference between RIC and MAC. So I think in children, this difference because in children, most of the cases are genetic, so you don't have a tumor to have the GVL. So that's why maybe uh, the RIC is preferred. So the decision on key or conditioning chemotherapy should be guided by the underlying trigger and by the patient comorbidity index and age. Next. Uh, sibling, next slide. sibling donors should be genetically tested, although in the literature, some uh, experts uh, where there is no match sibling, they did, sorry, the, the, the one before, they did uh, transplant from a sibling donor who had the gene, assuming that uh, the, if the sibling has a gene and this one has a gene, most likely the parents had a gene and 10% of the population or the majority of the population can have the gene without having the HLH. So it, it happened in the literature that some had this uh, uh, transplant from a sibling who had the gene. 
but usually it's better to have the transplant from somebody who doesn't have the gene, of course. Remission before transplant is a major prognostic feature. So if not in CR, we give alemtizumab prior to stem cell transplant. And for HLS secondary to lymphoma, some experts suggest consolidation with auto stem cell transplant. And some experts suggest consolidation with ALU for T cell uh, lymphomas. However, this should be decided case by case. And whenever there is a transplant decision, we need to refer to an HLH ex uh, expertise. So my final, I will conclude that adult HLH associated mortality remain high, especially malignancy associated HLH. Rapid diagnosis and early initiation of therapy is what are warranted. Adult tolerability to HLH 94 protocol, especially the etoposide, is less than pediatric. And novel agents such as alemtizumab, roxu, and imapolumab are being evaluated as first line for clinical uh, for use in secondary adult HLH. So there are uh, trials ongoing on clinic, uh, but there is no result yet. Our regional guidelines for management of adult specific disease, including HLH, is now updated, uh, uh, including all the novel agents that they were not there before, and revised by international experts and will be published soon. And again, uh, once again, sorry for the technical problem, really. Okay, thank you, Doctora. Finally, you made it. Thank you so much. And. Um... I think we are really behind, so we'll have maybe two questions. Uh, Dr. Sumbel, do you, uh, you want to ask your question? Yes, please. Uh, it's for Prof. Uh, Carl. Do you really stick to the uh, diagnostic criteria, or the old two, 2004 uh, criteria? Because, again, talking about systemic cancer GIA, I think it will be too late if, if you wait for all the criteria to be fulfilled. Uh, we still depend on doing bone marrow once we suspect uh, um, macrophage activation syndrome or secondly HLH, or sometimes even doing liver biopsy or spleen biopsy. I know sometimes that the bone marrow itself might be negative. So do you still wait to fulfill all the criteria? Because th that would delay the management significantly. Yeah, I think that's, that's an excellent question. <clears throat> I think that... Um... You know, especially sort of historically with um, hematologists, oncologists taking care of these patients, sometimes um, these patients are approached like you have to meet all the criteria and then you start the HLH 94 protocol and you stick to it. Um, I think that HLH is a really more <laughs> rheumatologic disease and it's making some of us think more <laughs> creatively like rheumatologists and more dynamically. And so actually what at our institution, what we've started doing is whether it's in the ICU or the emergency room or inpatient, if there's a patient of concern, so having a high ferritin, having a couple of concerning features, we convene a multidisciplinary team. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that triggers sort of a full immune evaluation, um, genetics evaluation, clinical evaluation. And so we sort of follow the patient's progress um, while also doing the diagnostic workup. And tip, I think it's not unusual for a patient to be started on steroids. Um, and then if they continue to progress uh, on dexamethasone or, or solumedrol, then to add in a Kinra. And if they progress through that, then to go to a toposide. But it, it kind of depends on the kinetics of the, how sick the patient's getting. If they're perfectly healthy to the ICU in two days, um, then I think um, that kind of patient sometimes would be started immediately on HLH 94 um, rather than having a more um, staged approach to it. And then we also gauge the patient's response. So, you know, how quickly you wean um, uh, kind of depends on, on the response uh, to therapy and how long the duration also matters. And so I think, um, you know, again, the question earlier about, um, well, when do you use HLH-94 and when do you use imipalumab? Imipalumab, again, was, um, it's FDA approved for patients who have failed, um, basically, frontline therapy, most frequently HLH-94 or 2000. And for, but I think moving forward, it, what, what the field really needs is some frontline trials um, so we can figure out how to manage these patients the best. But the, the challenge is going to be how do we classify these patients? So I guess I would advocate for a broad view, you know, with multidisciplinary collaborations where we all look at this together as opposed to each coming up with our own um, definitions uh, and clinical approaches. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I think sure, the sure, bottom sure. line I, I, is, is having... Making sure our rheumatologists are part of the team is, is critical. <laughs> but what you need to have probably high, high clinical index of suspicion. And in our practice, what we used to do now is to order ferritin uh, as baseline. Then if there is any changes, especially in those who are febrile, we'll keep following the ferritin level in case if there is like a surge of the level or there is sudden increment. Uh, 
especially if it's uh, coupled with like pancytopenia or high different enzymes or other changes in the clinical condition, then I think that, that will be top differential to consider. A good point. It's magnitude and um, acceleration are both important. Sure. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Uh, I have one question here. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's just a case. Uh, uh, somebody sent a case, uh, a baby with uh, extremely high ferritin, more than uh, 100,000, and COVID-19 positive, and uh, the patient died uh, of the disease. So do you have any such experience and can be, uh, in this case, COVID is a trigger for HLH or actually is familiar HLH from the start? That, that's a good question. I think it, de it depends also on how um, endemic the COVID is, if, there, if a lot of kids have COVID um, anyway. But I think um, we're struggling with trying to figure out the role of COVID in some of these patients who are presenting with, multi, with uh, hyperinflammatory syndromes. And I think um, um, the bottom line is we just don't know how, how immunogenic COVID is. It, it, you know, it's, it's unusual to have a baby have a, um, a, a fa fatal COVID from hyperinflammation, highly unusual. So I think it would be important to learn more about um, possible comorbidities and learn more about the, um, the genetics and susceptibility of the patient. But that's a very interesting case that it, it would be important to follow up. If it's possible to do sequencing, I think that would be really informative. Ali, do you allow me for another question? Uh, actually, we are very behind. So uh, one last, one last. I think the answer should be brief from Prof. Khan. Okay, okay. Go ahead. So do you do you recommend now doing like whole exome sequencing or just specific genetic testing for any case like mass secondary challenge? I think so. Um, we're we're learning quite a lot about it. I, I think the caveat is um, that it's important to work with a genetics team that is familiar with re interpreting these complex results because again, you'll, you'll get a lot of variants of uncertain significance and being able to compare it against um, uh, other databases, being able to model the possibility that it's, um, that the mutation is deleterious is important. But um, I think um, now there actually are quite good clinical services that have provide clinically actionable reports. So I, I, I think that it's, um, uh, I think it, that it is informative but have taken to context with the rest of the data. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Ali, before you conclude, can I just ask Dr. Carl one question? One, one only. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Carl, my role. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Regarding the GCSF, because um, usually there is here, especially in adults, uh, whether to use it, whether not to use it, usually I tend to, to give it for those with lymphoma and chemotherapy, but you know there are reports. So how about your practice? Do you give it or no? I'm sorry, to give GCSF? Yeah, for those who, who have HLH, yes, because of the theory that it will precipitate the HLH activity and capillary leak syndrome. Yeah, we don't give it to everyone, but in patients who have infections and neutropenia, we will. Um, what we do try to avoid is GM-CSF um, in those okay. patients. But I haven't anecdotally seen the adverse effect from CSF. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. We have... Uh... Uh, really, we have tried to uh, answer most of the questions, but because of the time, I think we cannot answer all of them. So just me for those we did not uh, answer their questions. And I think we have to conclude uh, uh, this nice sessions by uh, thanking our distinguished speakers, uh, excellent presentations, and we like it very much. Um,